therapy. And I think that people who get to have the pleasure of working with dough, it's almost like artists that get to work with clay. And we have that sensory aspect that's part of it. And it helps us to work out all the quirks, helps us to work out all the emotions, and really just to um, you know, achieve a, a wonderful psychological state. So I love the, the meaning and the, the whole process of the dough. And I, I also enjoy working with children and passing these traditions on. And I notice sometimes when you work with the kids, you bring them into the kitchen and you say, hey, how are you today? And they say, I'm oh, good, everything's okay. And you start working the dough. And there, they start to open up a little bit. About 10 minutes in, everything comes out. Like the biggest problem in life. What's, what's hurting on your heart? And the same thing with adults. And I think, you know, what a beautiful thing to just get people into the kitchen to have this therapy. I, I was blessed to be, be raised that way, but for those who aren't, it's a wonderful tool that we have at our hands. So the Mediterranean lifestyle um, and the diet, you know, is really a lifestyle. And it's much more than just the nutrients. But it's also the way that the food is enjoyed and the way that things are shared and the way that we enjoy the time at the table and the time in the kitchen. And so that's part of what makes it healthy and that's what I'll talk about today. So it's very informal. I have a 20 minute presentation. If you all have any questions, you know, at the end we'll, we'll go over all of them. No questions are too great. Some of the material might be a repeat of what you've heard since you've been here. Some might be new. Um, so feel free, all questions or discussions are, are up for grabs. And if, if there's something I have left out, please you know, let me know. So I want to talk about authentic Neapolitan pizza and its role in the Mediterranean diet. You know, we think about diet and pizza don't normally go hand in hand. So we're going we're gonna to talk about why that doesn't have to be true. Um, but the first thing I wanted to do is to start out with some facts. So Italian food is now currently the number one cuisine in the United States and the number one cuisine in the world. And believe it or not, more Americans eat more pizza, because it's not all the real pizza, but they eat a lot of what they call pizza, per person than we do in Italy nowadays. And pizza is even served to the American troops uh, a lot of times on July 4th at different places that they're stationed. So um, it's, a, it's you know, an emblem of Napoli, it's an emblem of the Italian culture, but it's also become very important in the American culture. Um, and believe it or not, a third of the Italian foods that are eaten in the United States are imported from Italy. And about uh, two-thirds are also made up of like the grande products and, and a lot of people who are doing artisan foods right here for us. So what I'm going to discuss today, um, and, and what you've obviously learned because you've had your hands in it, but for, the, for our guests, um, you, you all were here uh, month, the other days, were you Tuesday or Wednesday? Okay, so but for our guests, I'm going to go briefly over you know, what real pizza is and what makes it authentic and that kind of thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of pizza, and we'll talk about the health benefits, and then we'll talk about the role of the pizza in the Mediterranean diet. So the first thing is the tomato. You know, a lot of people associate Italian food with the tomato, but we didn't have the tomato pre-Columbus. So tomato is a new world food from Latin America, like potatoes, like corn, like chocolate, um, so peppers, so many things that if you go to the part of the that my family's from, Calabria, and tell them no peppers, no tomatoes, they will, they'll look at you like you're crazy. But a couple hundred years ago, we did not have that. So these are new world products that we integrated into the, making the pizza. And then you can look at some of these old cookbooks that they have from um, Naples. If you look for one 18th century cookbook called Il Cuoco Galante, you can find the first mention ever of the tomato and the, the basis of what tomato sauce was and what pizza was uh, back in those days. So he declared that the tomato was used to top the pizza and the pasta, and he actually gave a description of how that should be done in this very, very early cookbook. Now, what's interesting is pizza was always a street food. It was never a royal food, never something that was eaten in the palaces. But the writers, the cookbook writers in those days were the scholars. They were not the cooks. They were very separated from what was going on in the kitchen. So I find it interesting that this is a street food, but like they knew enough to talk about it very early on and give it some importance. So, um, you know, 1492, 15th, 16th century, it took quite a while before that plant that was used as an ornament in Spain got to be introduced and used in Italy. Uh, in the food. So the pizza margarita, uh, of course we get it from the name Regina Margarita or Queen Margarita, and it's named because when the royal family was visiting Naples, they made this pizza for her with the colors that looked like the Italian flag. So the tomatoes would represent the red, and the white would represent the mozzarella, and the green would represent um, the basil. And that's how we ended up with that particular pizza, which became the most famous one today. Um, and the first pizzerias were, bur were born in the 20th century in Naples. So this became uh, quite a thing, but it was when the, the Bourbons were in power in the very early 18th century that one of the kings actually wanted to go into one of the pizzeria and eat, and then it became a socially acceptable thing that everyone could do. 
Before that, it was kind of culturally, it was much more street food, it definitely was not something that the elite would want to do. But this time in the 18th century really uh, revolutionized pizza eating in Italy, because now it's something everybody does. It's a classless food, you know, it's, it's no matter where you're from, this is a food that you can enjoy. So, uh, for those of you who took the certification, already you know about Antonio Pace in, in 1984 and the development of the authentic Neapolitan pizza and the um, association of the Veracci Pizza Napoletana and what that means. But this standardization of food in Italy is nothing new. It's something that they've always done and it's something that um, all countries can benefit from and it's something that we're going to be seeing more and more in the world and more and more in the United States. So there's a term called um, GI, which not, not your kind of GI, right? but GI meaning geographic indicators, which is uh, the food that, like the DOP that tells us these are protected denomination of origin, um, wines, foods, things like that. Here in America, we have the Idaho potatoes as one of the wild main blueberries. So as we uh, use these products and benefit you know, the ones that are authentic, it really uh, gives a boost to the economy, depending upon where you're from, and it ensures that the product is true. So when you're looking at a product from a nutritional standpoint, if you know for sure that the ingredient has used a certain type of milk, and that it's been heated to a certain temperature, and that it's been um, held a certain way, it loses a certain amount of its moisture, it's standardized, then you can tell how nutritious it is. If, if we leave the, anybody up to make whatever kind of mozzarella they want and whatever kind of tomato they want, it's much harder to analyze it. And it's um, not only for the taste, but also for the nutritional benefits. So this becomes very, very important, and also for maintaining the traditions. And that's why pizza means what it does in Italy, and pizza means what it does in the United States, because these traditions um, were maintained even before they were standardized, they were still maintained. So for, for our masters already, they know about the water um, and the ingredients, you know, starting just with the ingredients of the pizza, the water, that it must be clean and not carbonated. It must have a pH balance of between six and seven. Now, I teach a lot of culinary medicine classes, so we talk about food and how they heal the body. And one of the things we can tell when people aren't healthy is their body will have a high acidic state. So like fried foods, meats, alcohol, those things, um, really give us a higher acidic level in our, in our blood, and it's not what we want. We want to try to have neutral. So if we already start out with a water that's very close to neutral, that gives us a good base um, for the ingredients. And also, this water will have a lot of calcium in it, which is also good, so another nutrient. So it sounds like, you know, it's a little trivial thing, water is water, and flavor is one thing, the way that it reacts to the dough and the yeast, but also for nutrition reasons, it's very important to start with a good water. Uh, in terms of the pizza. And the other thing is the flour. So um, I'm sure you all use the double zero flour um, in making the pizza. So, you know, a lot of times we have villainized flour in the United States. It's actually National Flour Month, by the way, but um, because a lot of people have celiac disease and have issues with gluten intolerance um, and some of the flours are modified, it's really gotten a bad name. But traditionally uh, made this way, the flour and the, the carbohydrates in the pizza were actually a good thing because they gave the body energy and minerals and things like that. Nowadays, we think of flour as a poor food. You know, we think of this as a cuchilla povera or anything related to flour. But it's important to remember that even up until like 100 years ago in Italy, the peasants couldn't afford the flour. Wheat was very expensive. And since the days of the Roman, it was taxed very heavily. So you had to be from the upper class to, be able to afford the wheat to begin with. So this, is, this um, idea of wheat being cheap and wheat the way it is, this is a very new thing. And in the days when pizza was invented, definitely was not that way. And I heard um, you guys talked a lot about salt, you know, when you were making the, the mozzarella, you talked about which kinds of salt do better in the dough of the pizza and also in the mozzarella. So we're, are we using kosher salt today in the pizza dough? Um, and the certified one, they're always using sea salt. So I'm going to talk a little bit about salt because um, you guys are cooks and you all are interested in health. And, and salt's an important topic because sodium gets a bad rap. But you know, we need sodium, a certain amount of sodium, in our bodies to live. Like it's an essential mineral and it helps with our nerve function. So we can't go without sodium. Like just because it, yes, there is a hypertension link, but also you need a little bit. So there are also some uh, tricks when you look at sodium and which can be good for the body and which can't. I did a thing on Channel 7 a couple months ago on salt. You can Google my name, Channel 7, and it'll come up for the full story. But basically what I want to talk about, the benefits of sea salt, because they have a lot of magnesium and potassium. So about two months ago, there was a study where they had two control groups of people. I'll just use, use you guys as an example. So you all were a group who were thin, you were healthy, and they gave you, you had no hypertension, no problems, and they gave you a low sodium diet. You all
people in this group were overweight, you all have hypertension, and they gave you a high sodium diet. Okay? But here's the trick. They gave this group also the mineral of magnesium to go along with it. This group they did not. At the end of the study, you'd be surprised, it was actually this group that did better. They were already unhealthy and they had a high sodium diet. But because they had magnesium supplements, the magnesium helped to counter effect the negative effects of the sodium. So this group did poor. Now the neat thing about sea salt is it automatically has magnesium and potassium in it. So when you're, if you're ever making, get the chance to make the decision as, as a chef and as a cook to be able to decide what kind of salt, it's not so much more to use unrefined sea salt. Um, it's, it's, um, you can get a, you know, a bottle like this, even retail prices like $2. So if you can use unrefined sea salt, it still has magnesium, it still has potassium in it. And that will help people to be able to, to eat sodium to enjoy it, but not to have the, the negative effects of that. Unfortunately, what happens with table salt is they take all the nutrients out, right? They strip it as refined. You take the nutrients out. They add in iodine, which is good, uh, but you can get iodine from other sources. But it, and then they add in some other chemicals. So the body doesn't know what to do with these chemicals. The body doesn't, now doesn't have the magnesium and the potassium, which is like the base nutrients needed in everything. And that's what gives us the problem. So sea salt gives us flavor, kosher salt gives us flavor, and anything we can get that's unrefined um, is really good for it in, in the world of salt. And also, we were talking about today about you know which pizza with the cheese seemed a little bit saltier, which one needed more salt or less. Uh, the salt levels in our body, or the cortisol levels in our body, cortisol is a stress hormone, and it's like the, the fight or flight hormone. So when we're stressed, whether it's emotional, physical, um, whatever, that this, the hormones raise, and we need more salt. I can always tell myself when I'm, when I'm stressed out, I'm doing too much, working too hard, because I'm afraid like the really thick salt, like I'm pretzels and things. That's a little indicator. People who are in that state will always want more salt. Maybe they're a marathon runner, a construction worker, need more salt. Um, however, if you're very like, peaceful and you're calm and you're not doing hard work, like a monk would, would probably have lower cortisol level, would need lower salt. So I get you know, beat up a lot of times in my cookbook. They always say, why don't you tell us exactly the amount of salt that you need? And I said, because I, when we say two tastes, we're not being difficult. It's because different people have different taste values. So that's, that's the idea behind the salt as well. And we'll talk a little bit a little about yeast. So nobody, you know, we, we don't hear so much about yeast anymore. It's not like a superfood and nobody's using it. But I actually went to a lecture at the Egyptian Embassy here in D.C. about five years ago where there was a doctor who actually um, was using yeast as a way to kill cancer cells. And he had all this proof of how the yeast kills the cancer cells. So um, good quality yeast is really important. Um, a lot of times when people talk about the Lea Domate or mother yeast, which people are doing on their own, which is absolutely a wonderful, beautiful tradition. But if you're using chemical yeast, like a baker's yeast, it has these compounds in it which help support immunity. And they're the beta-1,3 glucans. That's what they're called. So these, these uh, beta-1 glucans are not found in a lot of other substances. You can get the supplement at Vitamin Shop, or you can you know, use it in the yeast and then the bread and things like that and get it from that variety. So something which helps boost immunity in our body. And of course, with everything nowadays, we can use as much um, immunity helping and boosting as possible. But I'm going to talk about the two kinds of, of uh, main mozzarella that we use in the pizza. So this is the mozzarella di bufala, or the, the buffalo mozzarella. And then we're going to talk about the cow mozzarella. But um, this, this uh, mozzarella, the mozzarella di bufala compagno, DOP, these are all of the nutritional analysis of it. So this milk is a very, very rich milk. It has, for about 100 grams, which is three and a half ounces, 264 calories. It has 16.2 grams of protein. That's a lot of protein for a, for a, for a not meat. Um, 0.4 carbohydrate, 20 grams of fat. So it's a lot of fat, but you get a lot of bang for your buck with, with that type of fat. And also 320 milligrams of phosphorus, which is not easily found, and 245 milligrams of calcium. So that's almost half the amount of phosphorus that we need per day, just in the buffalo mozzarella, just in one serve. And then uh, a third of the calcium. The buffalo milk mozzarella is easily digested and has a lower level of lactose, for people who are lactose intolerant, than, uh, than uh, cow's milk. It also has low cholesterol. It has B1, B2, B6, B niacin. So all of those uh, great nutrients that help us uh, get stressed and in energy, especially like in the kitchen, we should all be taking more, more B vitamins than we need them. Uh, and then we have the cow's milk cheese. Uh, so the mozzarella, just made with cow's milk, is also a wonderfully pretty lean 
pretty low sodium uh, cheese in terms of the whole range of, of cheeses if you look at all of them. Mozzarella is a good option to have. So 60 calories, 6 grams of protein per serving, uh, 3 and a half grams of fat, of which only 2 and a half are saturated. So that's a very good lower amount of fat. Um, only 10 grams of uh, cholesterol, 40 grams of sodium, zero carbohydrates, um, and 80 grams of calcium. So the, the caramel mozzarella is still a great choice. Uh, we talked today a little bit about the difference between the fior di latte and the uh, regular mozzarella. Also, these are rich in biotin, riboflavin, um, niacin, protein, phosphorus, and uh, the D, E, and A vitamins as well. And then we come to the tomatoes. So to be the authentic, um, you know, Neapolitan pizza, we have to use a certain type of tomato. So we have this like marzano, that's uh, DOP. We have the uh, pomodorino, the, the corvara, which is also a great product. The pomodorino, the guerrero, the Vesuvio, uh, which is DOP. So Vesuvio, you all know about the, the, the volcano, right, Vesuvius. So, you know, we think about this thing, there's a lot of marketing done, that things are grown in, in, around Naples at the base of Vesuvius, or that they're grown around Sicily at the base of Mount Etna. Big deal. Is that just a marketing thing? Like it's cool, it's by a volcano. But yeah, it's a good marketing thing, but it's actually really true because that soil is so nutrient rich from the ash from the volcano that it makes everything grow better. So you cannot compare a tomato like this, even one that I know in my garden, which I, I'm really proud of them, but the, that soil, you just cannot um, compare the quality, the richness, and the nutrients that are in that soil from the volcano. So many of our products that we got, whether tomato from the New World, pepper from the New World, a grape from Greece, um, uh, lemons from, from North Africa, whenever we got these ingredients and we put them at the base of um, volcanoes, I'm taking credit, like as if you know, I was there at that time, put them at the base of volcanoes, they really got better. So you can look at like a little dock lemon that, that grows in North Africa that, that we originally got in Italy. When they planted them, the lemons would be like this, and they look like grapefruit. And that's all the work of the volcano, all the, the beautiful work of Mother Nature. So, these products really are superior in terms of nutrients and in terms of, of flavor, if we can get them. If we can't get them, okay, the best quality tomato you know, we can buy. But um, the lycopene that's in the tomato is a really powerful antioxidant. And it's, um, the tomato is one of the places that it's prevalent in. So Italians were voted the healthiest people in Europe last year, believe it or not, despite the fact that we eat pizza every, mostly all the time and, and pasta every day. So still these people in Europe, and a lot of people uh, credit lycopene as one of, the, one of the reasons for that. Another great reason for that is the olive oil. So olive oil is my very favorite ingredient, and if I had to ever be reincarnated into a food product, I would be olive oil, because I just think it's such an amazing product. Um, my fourth book is called The Ultra Mediterranean Diet Cookbook. And I had to have all the latest research of the Mediterranean uh, food, the Mediterranean diet in that book. And the, the amount of olive oil research was so disproportionate to everything else in the book that I'm actually doing a new book. They, they picked some of it out, and I'm doing another book just on olive oil. But these are all of the things that olive oil can help. So there's a saying in Italian, the production of olive oil isn't just a career, it's a tradition. And the olive oil is a national treasure. Um, here we have, you know, prevents the formation of blood clots. Lowers total blood cholesterol boosts the immune system against the negative effects of toxins, helps with against microorganisms, parasites, preventing risk of memory loss, any types of brain problems from trauma, rheumatoid arthritis, reduces the risk of different types of cancer, all of these products, because mainly different reasons. One, it's an anti-inflammatory, and one, it has wonderful um, nutrients in it and wonderful antioxidants. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those because how do you know if what you're using is a good olive oil? Unfortunately, they're not all the same. There's a lot of people called corrupt olive oil out there. And people who are making money off people who don't know the difference, which most of our market doesn't know the difference. So they're selling things with a high price of beautiful label. They're getting a lot of money for it, and it's not doing us any good. And we're thinking that it's doing all of that. So maybe there's a little bit of placebo effect there. But if we want to really make sure we're getting the good olive oil for our customers, for our bodies, for our flavor, for whatever we're doing, these are some of the things that we can look at. So the first thing you want to think about with olive oil is the virginity, right? Everybody knows extra virgin olive oil is a good thing. But what we don't know is that in our culture and in our current society, we're not doing anything a lot of times to test the virginity of the olive oil. So a corrupt producer can have an extra virgin olive oil. It says extra virgin right on there. It looks pretty. It's expensive. But it's not extra virgin. So it's not doing you any good. The real marker for the virginity in the olive oil is the acidity rate. 
So 0.8% acidity or less means that it's extra virgin. So if someone can test that for you, it's good. So if you get a supplier who gives you an, an, an extra virgin olive oil, he can tell you, or she, that it's 0.4% or it's 0.0% this percent, that's wonderful. They've done the work because they've proven that percentage. They might not prove, someone might not prove an extra virgin, but they'll prove the percentage. The other good thing we need to know about olive oil is the age. So in the, in the, in the in Italian, we say olio nuovo, vino vecchio, which means new oil, old wine. So just like you want to age the wine because it gets the characteristics and all this, it's the opposite of the oil. The, the sooner, the closer to the press you can get it, the more nutrients it's going to have, the more flavor it's going to have, the better it's going to be for you. The olive oil won't go bad. You know, if you keep it cool in a cool place, it's not going to go bad for like a year, at least, maybe even longer. But it's going to start losing a lot of its nutrients after like three months. So the, for health reasons, the quicker you can eat it, the better. For all of those other things we made before. Then you want to know about cultivars. So cultivar is the, the word that we use to describe the varieties of olive. There are 880 different varieties of olives that we know about on the market today. Um, probably in our lives we use a couple handfuls of them, even if we're big connoisseurs. But all of those cultivars have different flavor. And all of them have different level of nutrients, and all of them have different color oil, and different benefits to them. They, they're grown in different places. So nowadays we do things like we take cultivar from Spain, we bring it to California. We take one from Morocco, we bring it to Greece. We take one from Greece, we bring it to Greece. You can bring the cultivars from different places and grow them, but they all have their indigenous home of where they're from. And olive oil is kind of like wine in that you have a terroir. So, you know, I, I go to Italy a lot with uh, the Italian trade agency. And last year I went to two different conferences specifically about olive oil. And there we're pairing everything, every dish that we make, with a wine and with an olive oil. So that's the new trend. Like 10 years from now, you're going to be, pizza is very popular, even Italy with beer, you can pizza with beer. But, but um, beyond that, we're going to be pairing each dish with a specific olive oil, with a specific wine, talking about wine, which flavors. We, we professionally taste the flavors. I have a YouTube video if you all want to learn how to do this. And we taste the flavors and we see, ah, this is this notes that pairs best with this. And that kind of thing. All olives, see the color of these olives, they're like, there's a little bit green there. And, oh, come on, you can see this one, it's, it's a good example. It's a little green, and then it goes to black. So in, um, all olives are born in a green color, hence the term olive green, and they all die black. Some taste better green, some taste like the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Sicilian class olive, it's always green. The, uh, sometimes the nocciolata can be green. The, the black, like the calamata from, from Greece, they always go black. And they taste different. Different ones taste better at different times. Different ones make different oil at different times. So um, some, I like to mention that because some people think there's different. Some olives are green, some olives are like No, they all, they all age and mature differently. Um, and then the next thing we need to know about are the antioxidants. So the antioxidants in olive oil are called polyphenols. The polyphenols are the same antioxidants that are in red wine. That are good for us. So like when they say red wine is good for your heart, that's those polyphenols that are in the olive oil. And polyphenols are so important because they go into our body like scavengers and they get rid of all the bad stuff. So as many polyphenols as we can get, the better that will be to help all of those things that I mentioned in the other slide. Now, and the scale, the modern scale of polyphenols in olive oil can go from 0 to 900. So the higher close to 900 you go, the more polyphenols it has. How do we as lay people, as chefs, as home cooks know when, when olive oil has polyphenols? But one of the easy home tests that you can do just for yourself is to see the burn when the olive oil is done. So when we taste the oil, you, know, you want to heat it up in a cobalt blue glass, like the color of uh, Rob's shirt, because you don't want to be biased by the color. In the olden days, green olive used to be better than gold because it meant it was full of fruit and it was fresh. Nowadays, people are adding chlorophyll to make it green, so you can't use that anymore. So you don't want to look at the color. You look at the aroma and you taste it. When you taste it, you make this funny slurping sound. They're actually slurping it back to your taste buds here. Because what happens when they go here, in about 20 seconds, you're going to start to feel a burn. And that peppery burn is the polyphenols doing their job. So if you're slurping it out of the way I told you, and you're just not getting anything, you might as well be using water. You want to have that. If you're using it for health, for health reasons, you want to have the polyphenols. Um, and usually the stronger flavored ones, like that would pair with a good pizza, like that would pair with a good tomato sauce, those are going to have lots of polyphenols too. Um, olive oil and the cooking and the smoke point. How many of you have heard you can't fry an olive oil? Right? Two hands. If you had a penny for every time you heard you can't fry an olive oil, we'd all be the richest people in the world. But you can fry an olive oil. And the reason that thing got started was because in the olden days they were using pure olive oil. They weren't using extra virgin. So pure olive oil, if you go down like the hierarchy of olive oils, there's extra virgin, virgin, then there's pure, then there's pumice. 
Pumice is what's used to make soap. Pure is just one step above that. Very highly acidic. So that high acidic olive oil does not have a high smell point. You cannot fry it. That's correct. And I think that's what they were testing back then. I don't think they were like trying to be, you know, sell them the oil. I think that they were being honest. But if you test the extra virgin, it actually has a higher smell point than some of the other olive oils. It's a little cost prohibitive because it's so expensive, but it's really delicious and it's better for you than the other one. So you can fry it. Fry X. Yes. Oh my god, this. Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Um, and press it. So first cold pressed. That's when you're going to have the most nutrients, the most flavor. Whenever a bottle says first cold pressed, if they can back that up with a good, you know, USDA uh, organic kind of a symbol or a California North American Olive Oil Council uh, symbol or one of the DOP, PDO, then you know that it's first cold pressed. It's going to be better, worth more money than just cold pressed. All virgin olive oil should be cold pressed. So that's not really, if it's just a big old cold press, not a big deal. So it's first cold press, big deal, especially for nutrients and for health. Then, what's really important in what I, I know that you've learned today with um, Don Antonio and me this week, actually, was the importance of the leavening of the pizza. So there's a much different way that the body absorbs pizza, quote unquote, pizza crust. If you have just a standard pizza crust that's, that's not really um, done the proper way, or if you have the one that's done in the true authentic Neapolitan way. Because the authentic Neapolitan way has a lower, slower, longer rise, and it has a double rise. So as it rises, it actually makes the dough lighter. You're working with the same amount of product, but it becomes lighter. So those uh, 270 to 300 grams are going to affect you much differently than if you just took a slab of dough and, and the same amount and let it rise for 15 minutes. This is more easily digested on the stomach. It has a lighter uh, kind of a feel to it also. So when we get to a whole pizza, and we look at we look at the, the nutritional aspects. So I think I've got um, but basic, basically half carbohydrates, six percent fat, five and a half percent protein, and around eight hundred calories. That's what you're looking at um, with one of the standard pizzas like you all made today. So it's a meal in itself. It's a meal all in one, which is very important. We don't use that term a lot in uh, America now, but in, in Italy they use it a lot, and in Spain, a lot of places that follow the Mediterranean lifestyle, they really use this terminology. Um, it's important that plates, that the dishes, recipes, make one meal that people can just go and eat all together. It's easy to analyze, you know, it's, it's, it's something that completes you on the stomach. So you always hear that word a lot, but it's, it's a meal in itself. Um, and this, these are the components of that. So, again, Carbohydrates in the United States right now get a very bad rap. All carbohydrates are not very good equal, and also people in Italy tend to eat a higher amount uh, in general per person in, in carbohydrates. But remember, healthy people in Europe, so um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So this is this is what uh, a, a pizza will give us, in addition to all of those nutrients um, that I mentioned with the particular ingredients. So this is this is crotone, which is in Calabria. This is where my family is from, and the reason I, I put this in here is because this is how I got started. I noticed that my family here, everybody has a twin in Southern Italy. They all look the same, they all, they all are the same, except they speak different languages. And the ones over here are much less healthy than the ones over there. And um, from a very young age, I wanted to know, you know why that was. Because obviously we have the same blood, we have the same genes, we look alike, what's making a difference? So food is part of it, but also the lifestyle. And the way, um, that's what I really want to capture. Because a lot of people can talk about food and ingredients, but not the lifestyle. And um, so this is important. This is how we get into the Mediterranean diet. So when we talk uh, about the Mediterranean diet, it's important to know that UNESCO uh, just started protecting it, actually, as uh, one of the cultural patrimonies of humanity. And last year, pizza was also put on the, the um, UNESCO list. So both pizza and the Mediterranean diet now, thankfully, are being protected by UNESCO as important parts of our culture. But if you look at the, the Mediterranean diet pyramid, this is uh, done by Old Ways, which is I'm one of their culinary directors for. But here you see um, the bottom tier is like people moving around and people eating together. So before we even start talking about food, nowadays we want to talk about who we're going to eat the food with, we're going to be in company, and then we're going to be getting a lot of physical exercise. Another benefit of the authentic pizza is that it creates a little bit of exercise to make it. Eating the dough is work, right? Making the tomato sauce is, is work. Um, and eating together. So, you know, in Italy they always say that pizza be sour and sour. So, Saturday night is the tradition, right, Francesco? People go out together, they get together, they have pizza. Pizza in Italy is not the lonely food of the lonely or the food because they're moving and they, they got the truck outside so they can't afford a real meal or the time. They can't afford the time of a real meal, so they're eating pizza. Pizza is something you look forward to and you go out and 
they can be part of a celebration. So that aspect to me is very important in the Mediterranean lifestyle because they've done a lot of research that um, when we sit down to a meal, the, if we smell the aromas, for example, before we actually eat it, we'll digest the food more slowly, we'll absorb more of the nutrients. If we eat with others, we'll digest the food better and we'll absorb more of the nutrients. So all of these little things that sometimes we don't have time for are really, really the important base before we even get into the actual eating. Then the second tier, which is the biggest tier, is plant-based foods. So according to the Mediterranean diet, according to the Mediterranean lifestyle, the majority of our meals and the foods that we eat every day should be from this plant-based group. So whether it's vegetables, fruit, nuts, seeds, legumes, olive oil, herbs, spices, everything in that plant-based group, that should be the majority of our diet every day. And of course, the pizza fits really well into that category. Then we have uh, the fish and the seafood, which two to three times a week. So you say you give yourself an additional serving of fish, one additional serving per week, you'll reduce your risk of heart disease by 49%. So you eat fish twice, eat it three times, that kind of thing. Then we go up to the dairy. So we have that important dairy group, which again with the pizza, we have the mozzarella, so it's taking care of that um, important factor. And then meats and sweets on the top, because they're what we're supposed to be eating the least of. Um, just kind of like a luxury. But you know, getting back to the dairy, um, dairy really is an important staple in, in the Mediterranean lifestyle, all over the Mediterranean, but especially in Italy, because in the ancient times, when people were, were farming and they were nomadic people and they were roaming the lands, you couldn't afford to slaughter an animal every day and have a roast or you know, chicken or whatever for lunch or dinner. You could only keep those for special occasions. So the milk and the yogurt and the cheese with which people really sustained themselves on. So I'm very careful to point that out because a lot of a lot of my colleagues nowadays in the, in the Mediterranean diet world are downplaying the importance of cheese. Um, but, but, but if you're not vegan, cheese, cheese can be a very delicious and important uh, part of the diet. So getting back to the, the kind of the Italian attitude of eating the pizza together on San Luis uh, they say, chi mangia da solo si strozza in solitudine, which means if you eat alone, you strangle yourself in solitude. So it's, it's like a good thing to take away. No matter what you eat, you want to together with others, you'll be kind of setting yourself up for success, pleasure, but also health. And I just wanted to leave you all with a couple of things. My, my research on the Mediterranean diet, most of it is in this book. Um, you can get over there, and if you want to come to Italy with me, you have to register by July 21st, I do culinary tours. And um, I thank you all for your attention, and I'll take questions if any questions.